Jimmy Sony is the author of The Founders, an in-depth look into the people and events behind the creation of one of Silicon Valley's largest companies, PayPal. He's also written two other books and is a former managing editor of the Huffington Post. In the process of writing the book, Jimmy met with many of the key players involved in the creation of PayPal, including Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, Reid Hoffman, and Max Levchin. The story of PayPal is really the story of the men and women who built the company. Many of those have gone on to create incredible companies such as Yelp, LinkedIn, YouTube, Affirm, Tesla, and SpaceX. These men and women have been so successful that they were given their own collective name, the PayPal Mafia. Hi, Jimmy. Welcome to the Sensei Kojaku Show. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Jimmy, I'm going to start you off with a really, really simple question. Um, You know, I want to give you a softball so you can get going. Um, what, What do you think of Elon Musk? (laughs) <laughs> quite the softball uh and, and i suppose these days one has to be careful what one says no that's not true i don't have to be careful um what do i think of elon musk well i spent you know six long years of my life trying to understand this very particular sliver of his life right so i studied the years in which he was working on creating paypal roughly for your listeners that's the years 1998 to 2002 but part of the deep dive into his life was looking at everything that happened before 1998. So I could understand the kind of person he was, you know, before he gets there. And uh, my, my general take, you know, and we can double click on any of this is um, I pity any CEO of any company that is forced to face off against Elon Musk. I, I, I actually would feel sorry for some of these other public company CEOs or even private company CEOs who are trying to take, who are trying to like win market share from him. I just, I just don't, I don't think they're going, you know, I think it's impossible uh, because what he does is based on conviction. It's not, it's different. He has a different motivation, a different impulse from all of these other CEOs. And it is the reason for his success. It is the reason I suspect that, you know, he's a very difficult person to work for. Uh, but I, I do pity these people who have to compete against him because I don't think that's a competition most people can win. The first thing I want to talk about actually is this competitive spirit. So in your book, The Founders, there's a few central characters and one commonality, of course, the obvious things like they're incredibly intelligent, you know, generally fairly mathematically inclined. Um, but one of the maybe one of the aspects that people don't think about when they think of, you know, people in the tech world, they just think of nerdy sort of you know, guys buried in a computer, but you don't realize how competitive a lot of these people are. They, 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 you know, they will win at pretty much any cost. So could you talk about the competitive spirit that you saw either in your interactions with them or just generally researching them, whether it's Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, or any of the other protagonists in the book? Yeah. Oh, I have stories for days, but I, let me, let me start by saying, you know, I, I agree entirely with that assessment. Your assessment is very keen, which is not only is there competitiveness in the air, but it's also a kind of like concealed, like it it might be concealed to the general public. Like you wouldn't anticipate that a bunch of people who spend their life like pressing on keyboards and putting code into machines would be kind of like, you know, ruthless in their willingness to to win and to their desire to win. And maybe if you're in Silicon Valley, you know this, but for the outsider looking in, I don't think they realize just how intense the competition can be uh, in the world of, of, of bits, you know, in the world of, of code writing. Uh, I I also found that one needs this kind of competitiveness at a startup in order to succeed because at a startup, you are generally, if you're not taking on other startups, you are definitely taking on some incumbent within an industry, right? Right. Um, And so what happens is that in order to take on the incumbent, you don't really have many advantages. You generally don't have advantages of scale. You don't have capital, right? You're usually under-resourced. You don't, you don't have like the, 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 the densest Rolodex necessarily, but what you have is you have hustle and you have competitiveness and you have drive and you have time, right? And so if you can increase or pull the levers on any of those, you actually have a kind of strategic advantage against the competitor, Right. And so competitiveness and the desire to win, I think, is part and parcel of being in a startup. I think it's this, like we, we have this sort of latter day version of startup life where it's like, oh, it should all be a Zen garden. Everybody should be nice to each other. You know, why can't we all sort of get along? And I, 
I just I I I've looked at at this point many stories of startups being created in order to tell the story of PayPal well, and I can't find a startup that that got there, you know, without this kind of competitive drive. You asked about the people specifically at the heart of my story. I mean, Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, Reid Hoffman, David Sachs, Max Levchin, and on and on. You know, these are not shrinking violets, and these are people who, as you said, they. It's not just that they'll they'll try to win. You said at any cost. I, I there's some people I think who would want to win at any cost. I would actually say they want to win at anything. So in any contest, no matter how minor, they would like to win. I'll give you a couple of examples that have nothing to do with payment services or fintech or technology. Um, there's a great story that I learned that I didn't put in the book. So your listeners are getting something that's not in the book. Uh, one night in the early PayPal days, uh, Peter Thiel and Max Levchin and their teams, a very small team at this point, took two cars to get to a restaurant. They went and they ate at the restaurant for dinner. And the plan, uh, as apropos of startup life, was to return to the office after dinner. So they exit the restaurant and Peter goes into a car with a, with a gentleman named Russ Simmons, who's driving the car. Russ is later a co-founder of Yelp and also an early PayPal employee. Max goes into a different car he's driving. And as they leave the parking lot, I, I, can't, I don't exactly remember how it all started, but they start to race. <laughs> they race back from the restaurant to the office in Palo Alto. And Russ Simmons is driving the car. Peter Thiel's in the passenger seat. And Peter is egging him on, like getting him to go faster than Max in the other car. And like Russ is like, well, Peter's kind of my boss. Like, okay, and I'm, I'm competitive too. So he's like racing and racing and racing. And they pull into the parking lot of the office just before Max does. And Russ, you know, pumps the brakes, puts the car in park. Peter jumps out of the car, holds his hands up in victory, and sort of starts doing like the scene from Rocky after he's like reached the top of the stairs, like he's won. All because they were trying to get to the office faster than the other guy, right? And, and I, I have story after story like this where the se these seemingly inconsequential things would be turned into epic competitive battles, right? And so I, I think there is something to that. I mean, I know there's something to that. It is part and parcel of the character of the people who made this company. I don't think any of them would deny it. Uh, when I was interviewing Peter, uh, there's another story that did not make it into the book, but I was interviewing Peter. And I remember saying to him something about the market cap of PayPal, I think it was 2019, something like that compared to the market cap of Visa, both publicly traded companies. And I remember saying, you know, something about it. And he like took out his phone mid interview and starts looking up the stock tickers, to, I think effectively to make sure that the company that he created was bigger than what was at that point their rival Visa. And I, I you know, and again, you have to kind of admire this level of of just competitiveness over something that at that point in his life, I mean, he's Peter Thiel. He has no formal affiliation with PayPal. He has no dog in this fight. And yet, yet we must confirm this fact, right? And I, I, I am obviously I'm laughing about this and I, I came to appreciate the competitive spirit and I came to appreciate also what, what was a byproduct of it, which is discipline and rigor, right? And so what, what that competitiveness brought out was people's best work. It brought out a sense that there was a kind of got like an energy about the place that that I hope came through in the writing because it came through in my interviews with the people that I was speaking to that you know if if you were there you could not sort of sit back and like wait for things to happen you know it was expected that all employees were actually pretty intense and about their work whatever their work was I had a gentleman describe it to me this way he said in every role at PayPal we somehow ended up with like the very world's best person for that particular role, right? Whether it was HR or finance or anything. And I think part of that is that they were competitive with one another too. Everybody wanted to best each other in addition to beating their competition. So that was a, a long riff, but I think of this as actually like an underrated quality. I think sometimes competitiveness in contemporary society is looked down upon. But if I'm, let's say, investing in a public company, I want to find the public company CEO who wants to win, who not just do right and do right by shareholders and be ethical. I want to find the public company CEO that wants to win. That's what that's what this is. And, and that's what the game of business is, not at every level, but at, certainly at that level. 
And so I think there is something to this. And I actually think it's like an under indexed, underrated quality that we ought to, you know, we, we ought to make fashionable again. A line from a few good men, right? You, you want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. I think, I think that's, that's, right. that, that, that's exactly the kind of, so, so that, that's a really interesting point, right? That when it's, when the cameras are on and, you know, people are talking on podcasts or interviews, it's all very, you know, I love you, you love me, let's all hold hands and sing and dance. But when the doors close, these people can be very different, right? It's an interesting thing. The first point you made, the story about the car race, um, I want to actually talk about that from the perspective of risk aversion and, and another story that is included in the book. Um, Elon Musk, when he sold his first company, one of the things he indulged in was a McLaren F1 car, which is one of the rarest cars that was, that's ever been made. And it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful car, but therefore it is also incredibly difficult to handle. And there's this one scene when um, he and Peter Thiel are in the car, they're going some, I guess, to the office and he kind of loses control of the car. And, and what, what that told me, I mean, it, the point is not so much the story as it is the idea of risk aversion and in the context of these people. I wonder that is there something in their wiring that almost makes them immune to risk aversion and, and they sort of, they only see a goal and they can't, they don't think about the risks, the challenges involved and they're just like, okay, I need to go there. I'm just going to do whatever it takes to get there. Do you ever get that sense from them? On this one, I think it's very particular to the person. Um... I think Elon has an appetite for risk that is far higher than than his peers within Silicon Valley. I mean, this is just demonstrated over and over and over again. You know, when he sells his first company, he takes almost everything and plows it into the equity for his next company, right? Until a subsequent investor says, listen, you should take some off the table here. You're like risking your entire net worth, right? Um, I actually think Peter has a different... My understanding of Peter Thiel is that even in his writings about risk, he is not as risk taking. And he actually says, he challenges his view. He says, entrepreneurs are actually very good risk mitigators. Like what they do is they dial risk down very fast, right? Um, so I, I, I do think there's a certain look, if you're working in a startup where the next quarter or the next year is not guaranteed, you probably have more than an average appetite for risk. But I think even within Silicon Valley and even within the startup world, there are those who are more risk seeking and then there are more those who are more risk averse. And there is an, a series of arguments written about by the people where they're actually like, actually what, what good startup investors are and what good startup founders are, are people who just like are exceptionally good and fast risk mitigators. They eliminate risk very, very, very quickly. Popular um, moniker that's come out of PayPal in those days is the PayPal mafia. And it's been adopted across many in India, for example. And you notice in your book as well that you know, the Flipkart mafia has come. Mm -hmm. And really what it's referring to is this idea that from one company emerged a number of individuals who ended up creating, you know, unicorns or meaningful companies of their own over time. What I want to understand is, is it the case that there was something in the water at PayPal that made these people great? Or is it that PayPal or, you know, X.com and Confinity and what eventually became PayPal was just so, ex each of them was incredibly good at hiring talent. So therefore, they were primed for success just by hiring these people. Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's a sort of classic like nature nurture question, right? Like was the PayPal mafia foreordained once they got in the door or did something about PayPal make them who they are? And the truth is, this is actually like the animating question throughout the book. Like my entire purpose in doing this crazy six year adventure of finding these people and writing this book was to answer that question. Because it's one thing if you're just recruiting really talented people and kind of assembling this team and then leaving to their own devices. I think in the end, I, where I netted out on, on answering that question is it was both. So you had people who started the company who were exceptionally talented themselves, and they recruited people they thought were exceptionally talented. So you had to have a certain bar to like pass Elon Musk's smell test or pass a mask, Max Levchin, you know, engineering uh, interview or, or to, to, to be able to sit with Peter Thiel and not be intimidated by, by him and his questions and his intelligence, right? And so you have this nucleus of people, they are recruiting people they know, and they trust their smarts, their intellect, their intuition, their competitiveness, and they bring them into the fold. So there's like a talent nucleus that's built through networks. 
then you put them in this atmosphere where the only thing that they like can do to win is work super hard, iterate the product, come up with every fix and hack and tweak and, and change to make sure the company survives. Because this company, many people don't know, was created during the middle of the dot-com bubble bursting. So capital was not endless as it was during, let's like, say, like the years 1995 to 1998, when you could raise money for anything. So you've got a tremendous pressure on this company to stay alive. They have a burn rate that's between, depending on whose estimates you look at, between like 10 and $15 million a month. They have roughly 80 to $100 million in the bank. So let's say six months of runway, right? So you have super talented people in an environment in which their talent is required to keep the company alive. And so you have nature and you have nurture. And I think that one of the reasons that the people who formed the cohort of people who made PayPal and some of its earliest employees go on to later startup success they create Yelp, LinkedIn, YouTube, Yelp, Yammer, Palantir, SpaceX, Tesla, on and on. It's it's because of this experience. And the way the way Peter Thiel describes it, I think is, is largely accurate. He says, because it was successful but hard, we learned that like you could do a startup and it would be really hard, but you could be successful. He said, you learn a different lesson if you're successful and it's easy. And he said, and you learn a totally different lesson if it's if it fails and it was super hard, right? Because, and he's like, we, we hit the sweet spot, which is we were successful and it was brutally hard. So everybody took away from this, like, oh, the, the, you know, you can win, but it'll be really, really hard to get there. And if you look at the subsequent companies, so many of them had to operate under that same kind of pressure, but then also had that same kind of success. There is that sense that because they went through that battle together, there is a sense of even it, it gives you the confidence that you can overcome challenges over time, right? That, that you, that if you have the energy, you have the drive and passion to do something, you can actually make make a business out of it. Um, but I want to just take a second to actually talk about your own personal experiences, interacting with these people who today are, of course, household names. When you when you interviewed them or interacted with them, was it was it in a sort of formal interview setting or did you ever get a chance to see them in their sort of natural habitat actually at work and, and what they were really like? when the cameras were off? Well, I had the, I had the good fortune of having no cameras. So, so that was, that was good. I mean, I had my iPhone, you know, yeah. and so I was recording, but it was more natural than if somebody has a, has a camera on them. Um, you know, I was interviewing people at their offices. I was interviewing people at their homes. Um, I did some interviews that were walking interviews. Uh, I did, I mean, I, I, I sort of interviewed wherever I could, I interviewed people at cafes, you know, I interviewed people wherever, wherever they were willing to meet, I would say yes. Uh, it's one of my, my kind of principles when I'm meeting these people is you always say yes to whatever time they want. And you always say yes to whatever location they ask for their preferences rule. So if they told me they were available the next day across the country, I flew the next day across the country and it did not, it, you know, they didn't, they didn't know, they didn't know that I was taking a red eye flight. They just happened to have me at their at the right venue at the right time, right? So I was often interviewing people in the place that would probably be most natural for them. And what I what I found is, you know, I, I I had this interesting experience of like I didn't really know what to expect because, you know, you have there's a kind of um, in other with other wealthy people who are not in technology who are maybe in industries that were a little bit older, like finance or media. I found that wealth has certain uh, trappings. Like it, it leads people to act a certain way. Maybe they have many assistants or maybe they dress a certain way or, you know, there's a formality to your interactions with them. You, you, you have to sort of genuflect, you know, you're, 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 it's like you're meeting royalty. When I first met Peter Thiel, I don't think he was wearing shoes, right? I think he showed up in socks. Like there was, you know, like he shows up in his living room, he's wearing socks. Now that's perfectly fine. No, do what you do. You. It was just, it was interesting. And I was like, oh, okay, this is a little bit more fun. When Reed Hoffman first walked through the lobby of his office to meet me, he was wearing Crocs. Um, you know, and so there, and and I, I had a number of these experiences where they were like surprisingly casual, right? Um, not a, not not for every interview, but for a few, and it stood out to me in that way. Um, but I, I think the, the reason that I say that is because I found that the people I interviewed, no matter how powerful they were, no matter how wealthy they were, they actually had a kind of um, informality that I found very appealing. It, it, it was as though the wealth was just a side effect, almost like that, like nobody, like here's nobody offered to show me around their house, <laughs> you know, like 
not a single one of these people were like, let me show you around. You know, it was almost, it was almost like they were all in Airbnbs or something, you know? And it was actually one of these funny things about like, what would happen that has that happens a lot is when you interview prominent people, they want to show you the trappings of their prominence. They want to walk you around. They want to show you the photos. Politicians do this notoriously, by the way, right? They want to take you over and show you their wall of photos, whatever. With these people, I now that I'm thinking about it, we would dive right in. We would get right into the substance. And it was great for somebody who cares about the substance, who doesn't actually care about that stuff in their life. It was really great to just just dive in. I think it was 30 seconds between when Elon and I sat down, I explained the project, and we were we were going. And same with Peter, same with Reed. Now, part of that is none of them have time, so they don't have time to waste on pleasantries. But I think a lot of it is actually just that there's this weird thing where like all these trappings, all the artifice, a lot of this is just removed in this field. And, and again, I'm painting with a broad brush. I'm sure I'm wrong with a number of people. But I just found a kind of casualness and informality that I did not expect given the scale of some of these people's success. Uh, you know, I was never made to feel like I was lucky to get time with them. In fact, like the conversations were so engaging because they actually had like, they respected the questions that I asked and gave me real time and real answers as opposed to just talking points. And there was something about it that actually had a kind of honesty to it that you you don't find when you're speaking to people necessarily in, in, in political life. And did you find that if you didn't necessarily put them on a pedestal and you didn't have a overly reverential tone, they sort of, they liked you more, they, they were more open to talk and engage? Oh yeah. I mean, I think that's true for anybody, right? I mean, and just in general, um, I also came in insanely well prepared, right? So, so that's part of it is like, I, like to give you an example, like if I were interviewing, let's say, it was, let's say it was Elon. I mean, I watched every interview that Elon did and read every article that mentioned his name. I mean, for fifth, like for roughly a period of 15 years, like meaning from like the late eighties to the actually, no, sorry. From the early nineties to the mid two thousands, I had consumed everything. I, I found his congressional testimony when he was starting SpaceX. And I read that and you have to dig to find congressional testimony. Um, YouTube videos where I was like, the views were in the double digits. He gave some very obscure interviews in some very obscure places. I watched those. I listened to old radio interviews. I found old tapes, you know, and so I was coming in knowing the answers they had given to many of the questions they'd been asked. And I avoided those entirely. And so I, I had also read every, every piece of paper that they had written. I'd found every scrap. And so I came in that way. And I think that's that certainly helped. It helped to keep some of the anxiety at bay. It helped also to just kind of have me there and not worried that I had missed something, that I had like missed a trick, you know? Like, oh, did I like did I totally ignore this? No, because I read everything. <laughs> I read everything. It would have been impossible. And it took years to do that kind of preparation. But then once you're that prepared, you can go in and the conversation actually becomes a little bit a little bit easier to have. Yeah. But is there a trade-off to being that prepared in terms of when you go in, you go in with a lot of preconceived notions. And even though you may have no desire to do that, it's just, it's just a natural human thing, right? That I've read everything this guy's ever said. So I either like him or I don't, or I think he's smart or I don't. It, how, how, do you, how do you tackle that when you're doing research? And, and your goal is really to finally have a fact-based output. But, and you don't want your own opinion or prejudices to color that in any way. Yeah, it's a great question. I would say a couple of things. One is um, you have to ask the right questions, right? So I was I was very rarely like asking questions where I was putting my thumb on the scale. Um, I was always trying to get the person to tell me the story from their perspective, right? Uh, or to share something that happened that they remembered so that I'm not saying one way or the other, right, wrong, or otherwise. I'm just trying to get them to share their perspectives. And then what would happen is in a given moment, I might interview three people about the same moment and I could get each person's perspective and find a way to thread that into the book and then let the reader make their judgments. That's kind of step one. Step one is try to get to accumulate many perspectives. You, you, you know, you can't take anybody's word for it. You can't just like if Elon says something, you can, as a writer, you can't just be like, oh, well, <laughs> that's the gospel truth. There you go. Right. You have to do you have to do the Rashomon thing. You sort of have to find everybody and put their stories together, which is what I tried to do in the book, which is why. The, the, some of the best praise that people have given me is that it's even-handed, meaning I didn't bias the story in one direction or another, right? Um, the second thing I did 
was that whenever possible, I did not try to depend on people's memories. I tried to depend on paper. So I had access, like I was, I, somebody trusted me with about five gigabytes of email from this period. And the reason that the book has like the note that Peter sent to the company after 9-11, Elon's resignation note, Peter's note announcing Elon's departure, all of these little nuggets all came from just going through thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of emails. And so I didn't have to depend on somebody's recollection. I didn't have to depend on somebody saying, oh yeah, this is what happened. Cause I could just go back and say, well, on March 14th, this is what happened. So I'm going to write that because it's an actual email from March 14th. Right. And so that is a big part of the kind of work I do is, is you, you, you have to be skeptical of people. You have to assume that they're not, I can't remember what I did yesterday. You know, I mean, like most of us have terrible memories. I'm asking people to recall memories that happened 15 to 20 years ago. And so outside of a few moments, most of those memories are going to be fogged. They're going to be fogged up with everything. And so what you have to do is you have to go back and find paper. And then the last thing I would say is part of what I tried to do is I, I, I tried to find moments where this person that I was asking was going to be an unimpeachable authority on that topic specifically. So I'll give you an example. Within the world of, of PayPal recruiting, Tim Wenzel is like, he's like a Jedi master of a recruiter. It was his, I think it was like his great calling in life. There are some people you meet, this is their calling. His calling was to be a recruiter. And I got to ask him all the questions I wanted about recruiting and talent and everything else. And that, like, that's the source, you know, and it, like as close as you're going to get to the actual source, because he lived that every day. It was not something he did on the side. It was not something he, I tried that person. I want to find that person. And I did that for, for PayPal's fraud. I did that for fundraising. I did that for every function. I would try to find the person who was closest to the actual action was actually doing the work. I didn't, I wasn't always successful, but wherever possible, I tried to get as close as I could to that level of detail and find that person, even if that person is not a famous name or somebody that is in the headlines. So that's the last sort of trick was just trying to get as close as I could to the specific person who was actually had their finger on the button. I isn't really well with something that people like myself who are involved in public markets have to do every day, which is when, when researching a company. Um, you almost have, in, in a sense, you have to be a sort of investigative journalist, right? That there's a company that has a certain set of information that by law is put out every, you know, three months or so. But you have to accept that a lot of that is curated to make them look good, right? Oh, for sure. And your goal is to find the truth, not what makes them look good. The problem is if something makes them look bad, they're going to go out of their way to keep it out of the public domain. So what have you found to be the most effective tools to find the right answers and get to the facts when there's a very large incentive for the people who were involved in the in the events to actually hide the facts. Yeah, it's a great. I mean, this is my this is sort of what I what I do. Although I would say with PayPal, it was not there was not a lot of fact hiding. You know, I had the virtue of this story. I was writing about the story twenty years after it happened. So that's my one important asterisk is that I'm writing about something not they're not I'm not writing about a public company as it is actively in the markets. I'm not writing about the day-to-day. -day. What I'm writing about is something that happened many years ago. So people were a little bit more willing to be honest. I would say a few things. One is, um, you know, when you're looking at a public company or any company, you know, understanding management is an exercise of understanding people. And if people, I would say for, for either semi-prominent or prominent people, it's actually really easy these days to find interviews they've given, podcasts they've done, but you have to look at sources that are a little obscure. So here's an example. There are very good search engines now for podcasts where you can look up keywords and names, but no, but many fewer people use those search engines than you would think. So they'll use Google and they'll type in the word podcast and then a name, but you actually want to go to like a podcast specific search engine that is powered by the metadata that's within podcasts. And then you can, there are a bunch of these, there are some that are better than others, but you can then find you can go very deep because there's so many podcasts now that you can just find those individual keywords. You can track them down and then you can assemble that knowledge. So there was a period where I listened to every podcast that Peter Thiel did or where Peter Thiel was mentioned. I mean, I was like walking around, like trying to mainline everything, right? Um, 
that's that's one trick. Another another little tactic I used is that you know people, particularly prominent people who become CEOs, they they get their many of them get their first taste of leadership when they're in college, and colleges have newspapers. Today's colleges newspapers are often digitized, as are past issues. So I went back to the University of Pennsylvania digital papers, and I looked for every reference to the word Musk. So I learned a lot about the Musk ox during this process. But for a period of roughly like 10 years, I looked at every issue of the Daily Pennsylvanian, and I found Elon Musk's student government platform, which had never been discussed. He ran for student government when he was at Wharton, and I published this platform in the book, but it is his platform. Now, he didn't win this election, which is kind of interesting, um, but I found his student government platform. At the same time, when I was looking at the Stanford Daily, I found Reid Hoffman and Peter Thiel's student government platform when they were running for student government. And I published all three of these side by side to show how different these people were. And what's funny is their characters still shine through in these student government platforms. They're basically just like, you know, if you're looking at them today, you could probably pick them out if you were to anonymize them. So you can go back and look at, for example, like let's say there's a public company CEO named Joe Smith. If that person was a leader of any kind or of any organization, they were probably written about in the student newspaper. You never know what you're going to learn looking back that far, right? I would also say... Um, it's tempting to look at big names on a cap table or big names like who are early investors and think that they are going to give you the best information about why they made certain investments. What I found two things. One, obscure names on a cap table or on any kind of like investment sheet are actually a very good source of information because like I would find random people who had invested maybe $20,000, $30,000, $100,000 and they told me the real stories. It was not the people who invested millions of dollars because typically institutional investors are playing the same game you described earlier. If they do a press release, it's manicured. It's 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 designed for performance. But a random person who happened to get in in like a Series A or, or friends and family, their stories are much, much, much better. And then connected to that, I would also say um, time-limited Google searches are a great, great friend to a researcher. So... You know, people use Google, but what they don't know is like uh, what many people don't know. You can you can set Google to search for certain time intervals, and I would use that to great effect. There's another Google feature called Scholar.Google.com. So a lot of stuff that's published in in Scholar.Google.com won't show up high on a normal Google search. So I would use Scholar.Google.com. My other favorite resource is the Internet Archive, and the Internet Archive is just an incredible digital collection. Very, it's very well done. These people do yeoman's work, and I use that to find additional information about them that was not available anywhere else. Um, there's a final, final thing in case this is of interest to your listeners. See the C-SPAN video archive. If you're ever looking at American companies, I bet this is by a bias in the direction of America, but they, they may be an Indian equivalent. C-SPAN is an archive of videos that is underrated because they go back very far. And so you'll find stuff on there that you wouldn't necessarily find on YouTube, right? And I, I so I think there's a little bit of just, you know, I, I suppose what your listeners are thinking is like, can I abstract any general principles from that massive amount of information you just threw my way? One is look where other people are not looking. That is really important. Like if you look where everyone's looking, you're just going to learn the same stuff everybody else. If you read the same books, you'll find the same information. I found new things about these people because I looked where other people weren't looking. Number two Older is generally better. Like older sources are for certain kind of research. Older sources are better because people are less polished. They become more polished when they gain money and, and fame, right? So if you want people at their least polished, go back to their college newspapers, right? And then I would say like the third big principle is you, you have to, there's a certain amount of this that is just obsessiveness. You just have to want to find the answer. I I would spend whole days just looking at the Daily Pennsylvanian to find the answer. I can't actually today tell you what possessed me to do this. Like it's like some mix of like ambition and madness and and a little bit of caffeine. But I think part of it is you can look and study yourself to see the moments when you bring that obsessiveness to the task of research. Like you can study yourself like as an observer and say, oh, you know, I was really obsessed with this thing. Maybe I should lean in that direction and figure out everything I can about that. For me, I just found that like book writing brings out that obsessiveness in me. Incredibly comprehensive answer. And, and 
I, <laughs> Probably I, more than you wanted, but forgive me. That's actually, I mean, there were some incredibly useful things, right? For example, I, I didn't realize that there are podcast-specific search engines. I didn't, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know that you can limit your Google searches to specific time periods. I mean, so, so I mean, I, I can tell you I already have gained from, from your answer. So thank you for that. Oh, and, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll give you yeah. one more that really helped me. Talkwalker. So people know Google Alerts. They don't know Talkwalker. Talkwalker is way more comprehensive than Google. Google, as best as I can tell, kind of underinvested in Google Alerts, which is actually a real shame because it's a great, it was a great product. Talkwalker is what Google Alerts would be if they had kept it up. Google, Talkwalker covers Reddit, blogs, Twitter, a bunch of other places, and you can set keywords and it can give you, it'll give you all the sources. It'll give you, it also can give you just the best. It can give you as it happens. So if there's a name you want as it happens, it'll give you that. Talkwalker saved my saved my skin because I could just set that and anytime anyone commented anything on the Payville Mafia on the internet, I knew about it. I knew about it within seconds and I could pull it right away. And so that actually is like one of those, again, another tool where if you're studying a public company, you maybe read what's in the Wall Street Journal, but if you want to find out what people in the obscure corners of the internet are saying, use Talkwalker and set the company name and some keywords as a search and have that alert come to you. And over time, you can accumulate vast amounts of information that way. You, you in, your, in your answer, you mentioned that older is better. And I, I think that's such a fantastic point, right? That, for example, I mean, if we talk with the American context, I know Stanford has put out videos of, you know, tech entrepreneurs from, say, 10, 15, 20 years back, and who today are household names. I think of, you know, for example, Jensen Huang at NVIDIA. And okay, today everyone's talking about him, but the fact is 10, 15 years back when most people didn't even know he existed, he came and gave like hour long talks at Stanford and, and, and you see them at their rawest, right? When, when, they're, when they're relatively unknown, um, barring certain sort of niche interest groups that, that know about these people. Um, so I think, I think that's a really interesting point. And, and I wanna actually talk about that in the context of um, PayPal and, and the folks at PayPal. Um, I mean, the original folks at PayPal. And I, I want to talk about how you see them today versus, say, 15, 20 years back when they were actually in the trenches building that company. And if you, if you sort of track that evolution and how their experiences in the business change them either for better or worse as businessmen and I mean, I don't, I don't want to comment on, you know, their personal lives or anything like that, but I, ju I just want to get a sense of, is it possible that you can draw a line from events that happen at PayPal or X.com to the person that Elon is today? And, and, and I'll give you an example, okay? In, in the book, you talk, about, you talk about Elon and he's this incredibly driven, you know, guy who sort of takes no prisoners. But there's moments of softness that you see in them, right? That, they, that they are human, that they can be incredibly warm, generous people. And, and I want to connect that to something that I read about fairly recently, which is, you know, once he took over Twitter and of course a lot of people were laid off. And I think they very recently realized that people didn't get the severance or packages they were actually due. And he's gone out of his way to make sure that they sort of get what, what they deserve. And these, these are people who are no longer connected to the company, right? So I, I don't, I mean, I'm not even sure if there's necessarily a legal reason for him to do so. I don't know if there is. But the, the, the point is that for all the sort of, you know, perception of this guy who's like ruthless, there is a very human, generous, warm element, element to them as well. So again, that's my long-winded way of asking that if there's a way that you can see who they truly are when, you know, like you said, older is better and see who they truly are at, in their younger selves and whether they change a lot over time, whether life or experiences change them or in a sense, tigers really do never change their stripes. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think, I think if you were to ask them, I think they would say they were very different. And I think if you ask me, I would say there's so much about them that is the same. And then I think that's the value of being an outside observer as opposed to the person living life, right? Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, it it is it is like it, it's it's actually interesting that to this day, some of the the disagreements that they had still kind of like come up in little ways when I was interviewing them, right? Um, and 
And so there's like little moments that become snippy between people. I'll give you an example, which is um, Peter Thiel, famously a very good chess player. During the IPO party at PayPal, they set up 10 chess boards and Peter's playing 10 simultaneous games of chess. The only person to beat him is David Sachs. And this becomes like a consequential moment in it's immortalized in a photo where David has his hands up in the air in victory. And they did a 20th anniversary PayPal reunion event. I was fortunate enough to be invited just because I'd written this book. I knew everybody. And uh, they were kind enough to extend me an invitation. And I did a little panel where I was interviewing David and Peter. And uh, we talked, we started off by by saying something. And, and David's like, yeah, that was like the IPO party where I beat you at that chess game. <laughs> and Peter says, you know, you've really talked about that a lot in, for over 20 years. You know, it's sort of become this thing. And it was so funny to see that, like, jokingly, obviously, but kind of still remember these moments. Um, the broader answer to your question is, I noticed how similar they were to the people they were when I was studying them, you know, like, like it was like, it was like the people that I was looking at were just graduate, you know, they were older, wiser, uh, but largely the same, you know, not largely, but you know what I mean? Like, like I would give you an example, let me give you an example. Like um, Max Levchin to this day can, has a photographic memory and can tell me exactly the puzzle questions that, he and Peter traded when they were first getting to know each other, like math puzzle questions, right? Uh, which I put in the book for anybody who has that bent and wants to attack those questions. Um, you know, it was interesting to like to listen to like their thoughts on education, which are not really that different from when they were receiving their own educations, right? And it was interesting to be with Elon. The first thing Elon said to me, because I, I didn't know what to say to him. I just walked into his foyer. He's taking me back to his living room. And... I didn't know what to say. So I tried to fill the silence and I said, Oh, thank you. Know, it was a Saturday. So I said, Oh, thanks for doing this on a Saturday. I, you know, I appreciate it. And he kind of didn't even really turn around. He said, well, I work seven days a week, so it's all good. Um, and I was like, okay, you, you are exactly who you, you know, like I get it. All right. I see where it comes from. Um, so there's a little bit of like, and now if you were to ask them what they would say, so I'm totally different. I, you know, I've grown so much, you know, but I think there are certain essential piece, person, pieces of a person's, person's character that are the same. Uh, and, I, and I would say that's true for me. And like, I think in writing biographies, one of the things you learn is people do change and you hope they sort of mature and improve, but there are parts of us that stay the same. And, and I don't think that's a, that's a bad thing, by the way. I think that's like a, a powerful part of our nature stays the same. And then we kind of like find different environments and see where our nature best fits our environment. And one of the things about this story is that I do feel like these people's nature fit in the most productive venue and maybe the only venue where their nature would have worked as well as it did. Because I, I interviewed so many people who could not have actually, I don't know where else they would have found functional lives, right, in economic life. You know, when you're in school and college, well, I guess maybe more school, there's this idea that the smart guy is simply the guy who gets the best grades, right? And... As you go through life, you realize that intelligence comes in all sorts of forms. And intelligence really is, if you think about it, as the ability to solve a given problem. The nature of problems are multivariate when you go and, and let's take the example of running a business like um, PayPal. There's the obvious problems of, you know, you need engineers, you need finance folks, you need HR guys. But there's also someone you need who can liaise with government agencies. And that's, for example, a very, very specific skill set. When you were researching these companies, talking to all these people, what were some of your own ideas or lessons that you learned on conceptions and misconceptions that people often have on intelligence and what makes someone intelligent? And how has that and how has this entire experience changed your own perspective on whether someone is a valuable asset and in a very broad sense should be considered intelligent. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. And I, I, you know, it's a question I'm going to think about well after our recording is done. Uh, so I'll give you my first draft answer, right? Which is my first draft answer is I think we highly overrate intelligence. And I think we off what we often miss, we often mistake what looks like intelligence what looks like intelligence is often just drive. Um, like what looks like genius is often just this kind of indomitable will, right? Uh, it, it is that there are plenty of people who know more about physics and about rocket engineering than Elon Musk. 
Uh, Elon Musk is the person who built SpaceX, right? Um, there are plenty of people who know more about international payment systems than some of the people who are at the heart of this story. These are the people who built PayPal, right? And so we have, a, we confuse intelligence and we kind of like, I, I think we, we, we do this thing of like, it, it, it is, it is rarely, I think there's so many stories of like the high school valedictorian who doesn't end up actually amounting to very much. Right. Um, and it's a different set of skills, traits, habits, experiences that take somebody who is just sort of generically smart and can turn them into somebody that can, let's say, like build a company or make a breakthrough in science or something, right? And I don't, I mean, again, I'm sure there are people who are smarter than me who have done this research, but my view of intelligence is modified in that I think I would rather, like if I were hiring somebody, I'd rather have the less, less intelligent person who's more driven than the more intelligent person who's less driven. And I don't know that I fully appreciated that it wasn't just intelligence with this particular group of people. I thought, as many people do, like you've got, you know, Max Levchin, photographic memory, Peter Thiel, chess champion, Elon Musk, like read every book in the encyclopedia when he was 12, all that stuff. And there's a certain like table stakes intelligence that's required, right? But I think what makes him successful is something beyond that, which is Max Levchin's willingness to pull back-to-back -back all-nighters to get a piece of code done. You know, Elon's willingness to bet it all and to bet his whole fortune onto this and, you know, in, and see if it'll, see if the, he can make it just on his own wits and, and by the success of his companies. Um, it is Peter's willingness to like take second chances on people, right? It's a, it's a different kind of intelligence. It's not the intelligence that wins you uh, awards or prizes or great test scores. It is a kind of, it's a curious mix of like um, hustle, uh, drive, anger, ambition it's it's something else and i would say that i am more acutely aware of that in the aftermath of writing this book that like i just know now that when someone tells me that someone is smart that actually means very little to me right that actually like raw intelligence i think is is fine for what it is but it's kind of it, it's like it's like it's good ingredients but you haven't told me anything about how the cake is going to taste <laughs> that's a, that, yeah that, that's a great analogy right like you can you can even have the right ingredients but if you don't put it together in the in the correct manner it's not going to be a great final product so that yeah that's that's a, i think that's a that's a really interesting way to to think about it and and you spoke about drive and and i know we've touched about this in some way through the conversation but i want to talk about i want i want to sort of contrast some of the the protagonists in your book and and what you think drive? What what do you think drove them at that time? You know, at least if for you know who knows what drives them today. But but if you think about that that period in their lives, um, do you do you get the sense that any of them were fundamentally purely motivated by financial gain, or do you think that was just an element of it, or do you even think that that did, that did not feature in their minds at all? And so I'll, I'll give you the example of someone like Max Levchin. My, my sort of my feeling when I read your book was that he was purely driven by the love of the game, right? He, as an engineer, wanted to, there was, you know, question is what's one plus one? I have to spend my entire life figuring out what one plus one is, right? It's not about am I going to make money off that or not? And then I see some other people, I'm not talking about the people in your book, but just people in life who, it's like as long as you put a note in front of them, they'll do whatever you want, right? So I, I, I want to get a sense of when you were interacting with these people and your general observations of them, did you, what, what do you think truly drove them? Was it money? Was it a combination of money and other things? Or was it just purely other things? Yeah, it, it's, it, the answer I'll give it is that I, it was very dependent on the specific person and, and where they were and what their circumstances were. Um, in general, your observation is spot on, particularly about Max. I mean, he he came to America with very little and started, you know, very modestly in life, very modestly. And so the money mattered. I mean, he was, you know, he didn't want, he didn't want to not have money, right? Um, but past a certain point, I never, in my, in my, in my men, in my several interviews with him, in my years studying him, I never got the sense that the the dollar figure is the game that he is playing that like, that actually just, that's not the scoreboard where he's measuring himself. Um, his great thrills come from cracking a puzzle or a problem, particularly difficult problems. Um, there's a, there's a couple great stories. One I didn't include in the book 
where um where, where Peter has to essentially convince Max that just because something is hard to solve doesn't make it valuable, right? That like that like actually there's there's like he because he he's very good at like stubbornly pursuing hard problems. And it, it's Peter who in some meaningful way, he's one of the people who uh, I guess teaches or coaches Max about like just because something is hard doesn't give it value, you know? That's not like intrinsic value. And it's funny because later his fund that he invests in after, uh, that he creates to invest in other companies after Paypal is called HVF, Hard Valuable Fund. Um, and so it was a sort of uh, an homage, I think, in part to Peter. Um, but I think that's like a, a thing that's important is that for each person, the motivation was different. You'd, you'd be lying if you said the money didn't matter. But in some ways, like past a certain point, the money ceases to, it becomes an abstraction almost, right? I, I, again, back to my earlier observation, I never got the sense that any of these people were trying to impress me with the wealth that they had, right? Not a single one of them. They didn't show me anything fancy. If anything, it was quite the opposite, right? It was really, it was, it was almost kind of like an allergic reaction to anything that was too ostentatious, right? And I'm sure, by the way, like I'm sure their closest friends would have a very different observation of them. Remember, I'm not a friend. I wasn't there trying to be a friend. I'm somebody that's writing about a very specific four and a half, five year interval in their life. But based on a very rigorous study of that, what I can tell you is like, if the money mattered, they would be behaving very differently than they do today. Because if the money was all that mattered, they've made enough that they would not work seven days a week. They've made enough that Max Levchin would not launch a firm, another publicly traded company. They would, they've would. they made enough that they would not engage in the kinds of things they engage in now, right? Because if the money mattered, why would it, they, they have enough, they have plenty, they have plenty for, they have enough for many lifetimes. And so I did get the sense that like the money wasn't the metric. I think that one of the interesting things about Silicon Valley is that it does attract a particular kind of puzzle solving person. So I did uh, a common thread, not just among the people who I named who are well-known names, but among pretty much everybody in the team is that there was a high premium placed if you were like good at riddles, at puzzles, at word games. When I was going through all those emails I described, one of the things that I had the good fortune to find was actually this thing called the Weekly Pal. It was a weekly company newsletter. And every week, the company newsletter would include a little puzzle. And... I would then in the following week, see how many people had written in with correct responses to this puzzle. There was no prize. There was no financial prize. There was simply bragging rights that your name would appear in the subsequent week's newsletter if you correctly answered this puzzle. But I, I must, you know, there were dozens of names that's on, on some of these. And it was just people spending time trying to solve these like riddles and puzzles because they, it was like for bragging rights, you know, maybe it was a mix of, of, of ego and of, um, of just a, a desire to crack the puzzle. But I did find this curious thing at the heart of the story around, around puzzles, riddles, math problems, games, chess, poker, that game playing thing was in the, was a, was a motivation and was a driver. And so I would say, look, it's like anything else. Like most people's ambitions are not one singular ambition, right? It's not, it's a welter of things. You kind of have a cocktail of different things you pour in. And so, but I think that for a number of the people we've discussed, that cocktail is more pure than just dollars, than just riches. It, 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 you couldn't work the way these people work if your only goal in life was to make money. It would just, you you couldn't do it. It'd be impossible. You'd wake up every day and like, I mean, be be one. You'd be utterly miserable, and two, you would you would have long since won the game. The game would have been over, right? You would have finished whatever you were trying to do, and there wasn't that kind of now. But but you ask them a good puzzle or a good problem, and all of a sudden, like you get juices flowing. And I'll give you one last story on this. Um, as a part of the the twentieth anniversary party. There, there was a there was a, re, a kind of party at Peter Thiel's home, and all the alumni are gathered there. And I had connected with this company that had run a series of games for a number of the people at like these elaborate games for the people who are a part of the PayPal story. And I put them in touch with the party organizers, and that company Shinteki came out and organized a, a game like a puzzle solving thing throughout Peter's home cards here or some other thing here, et cetera. And at the party, when I was there, everybody's meeting, mingling, seeing friends they have not seen for, for years. You know, in some cases, 20 years had gone by. 
And I looked over and I saw Max Levchin at the table <laughs> with the deck of cards trying to solve the puzzle at this one particular station, standing there by himself, still playing, to, you know, still the same person he is. And obviously he obviously met and mingled and did all of that later and, you know, had several, had nice interaction with him later. But I just remember that moment thinking, this really is, this really is who you are. You are just there to solve every problem you can get your hands on. <laughs> It's fascinating. I mean, I mean, listening listening to these stories, and 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 it's 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 what what we spoke about earlier, right? That that sometimes the tiger just doesn't change his stripes. That there is something so integral and core to these people that it doesn't matter money, no money, a reason to do it, incentive, no incentive. They just there's certain things that just drive them. They just they just want to do no matter what. And and I think I think it's yeah. interesting that a company like PayPal, that sort of competitive environment, I think brings that out even more, right? That that there's this drive that I want to be, okay, I'm, I'm better than Jimmy. And the only way I can show that is I solve the puzzle, but Jimmy can't, right? How else you show it? The, the, and it has to be, and you really want to do the harder the problem, the greater the chance that you can set yourself apart from everyone else, right? Um, That's but, right. Yeah, and, and, and so there's, there's an interesting thing that I've seen with successful people in, in a number of industries, not just, not just tech or business even. And it's a weird thing in a sense to talk about because, I mean, you don't necessarily think of it. But it seems to me that a lot of these people tend to have boundless energy, right? That, there's, that they, can, they can just survive on three hours of sleep for months on end. Um, and, and it's not like the remaining 21 hours they're watching TV or, you know, relaxing on a beach, right? I mean, it's really hard work. You're using your mind, draining every resource you have in a sense. But somehow recharging the batteries just doesn't seem to take as long as it does for people, for everyone else, it seems. Did you, did you, did you ever, did you... I mean, I don't. I don't even know how to frame the question. I. I don't even know what the question is exactly. It's just. It's just. Did you. Did you ever get. Get. Get that sense that they. See, that it's almost like they just. They just seem to have reserves that the. The rest of us don't. I think that's very true. Uh, not for everybody. Again, we're. We're. You know, I'm painting with a broad brush, and there are some people who. Who are more monomaniacal than others. But you're absolutely right. There is a. a just qualitatively, a very different energy to somebody like. Uh, a, a Max or a David Sachs or a Reed than there is to the average person. Um, it's hard to pinpoint exactly where it comes from because I think it's it's like the nature thing we were talking about. I think some of it is just, you know, there are people you meet in life where um, they have that. I'll, I'll actually give you a great, great quote from somebody else who has this, Roloff Botha, who's today the head of Sequoia Capital. He was at the time one of the junior members of the team but became the CFO of the company, helped to take it public. Really great interviewee for me, uh, provided a lot of context, particularly around fraud fighting and around the business model. Roloff had this line. He actually turned Elon down a couple times for a job at, at X.com, the company that became PayPal. And he said, I said, so what made you say yes, ultimately? Or what made you even remember to reach out to Elon later when you needed a job? He said, you know, there are some people you meet and you forget them right away. And he said, Elon lingers. And I always thought it was like an Elon lingers. Like he 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 has an energy that is actually infectious, that actually excites people. And I I don't think that, I mean, I think that's something that you can train. Like you can train yourself to work longer hours, but there are some people who's like just base, their base starts higher. And I do think that a number of the people I interviewed in this particular story have that. They just have this endurance. They also like, you know, they, they, many of them do endurance sports or they did other competitive things that have a kind of endurance element to them. I do think you're right in your observation that there are some people who have this energy. And if you are like a public company investor who's listening to this podcast, like it should be faintly obvious that like you want the more energetic CEO against the less energetic CEO, right? Because you'll win if you're more energetic. But part of what I think happens is like, and I've read a lot about this in other contexts. Like it's about aligning that energy with a, a a purpose or a profession that actually brings it out of you, as opposed to like you having to force it, right? So in a weird way, I think Elon, as an investment banker, would have been terrible. Like I think he would have been miserable. Um, Elon, as a startup founder, I think is actually like the ideal matchup of person to profession. 
And, and that to me is actually kind of an interesting thing is like finding the place where your energy works best is, is it's why like there is a kind of synthesis that happens when that person has that job. Um, it's actually also why I think like founder CEOs are often like wildly more successful than their counterparts. Not always, but like founder CEOs of public companies, you know, like when the way you often hear these stories, they come back, they take over the company. Steve Jobs famously comes back, takes back over Apple, right? Reed Hastings ran Netflix for years and years and years. Uh, I don't know if he's still the CEO. Uh, Amazon under Jeff Bezos, right? Ran it for Mark Zuckerberg, Meta. You look at story after story and you're like, well, what is, you know, this person matured with the company, but they also have that thing you were describing. That energy comes from a different place than just trying to make sure that the next quarter is better than the last quarter. I'll just add one caveat to something you said. I think in public markets investing, you want to go with the guy who has more energy, assuming he isn't an idiot or morally bankrupt. <laughs> Fair, yeah. In that case, you want the lazy idiot. But Jimmy, oh, I, like, I, I think part of, part of it too is that like, these jobs are just demanding, right? So like the truth is you, you can't be a slouch whether you're running a public company or you're creating a startup from scratch that's going to try to disrupt fintech, you know, there's a certain amount of this that is just like obvious. Like it's a sort of brain dead obvious. You are not going to beat Citibank. You're not going to beat Visa if you only want to work nine to five, right? Like you're just not. If you want to run a multi-billion dollar company, that is not a job that is going to stop at a certain hour, right? Much as we might want it to, it simply isn't the way it works. And I think the the the, the sooner we accept that reality, the, the the faster we all kind of actually accept that some people might just be suited for these jobs and other people might not be. Someone who's only willing to work nine to five would be weeded out from high performance business yeah. very quickly. I, I don't think they'd go very far. Yeah. But Jimmy, I just want to end with one question and I actually want to talk about your work. I, I mean, I don't know if you're at liberty to disclose anything, but is, is there something you're working on in particular right now or... Are you just researching various things to find something in particular to write about? Yeah, no, I'm actually doing an, another um, and one project I have underway is a book about uh, this company that was the Steve Jobs' company between his Apple tenures. So I'm working on a book about Next Computer. Jobs is famously, for those who are listening who don't know, Jobs was fired from Apple in 1985. He returns to Apple in 1997, 12 years. During that 12-year period, he builds a computer company called Next. Apple acquires Next, and it's one part of the process that brings him back to Apple. But the story of Next is actually very interesting, and it's 12 years, and it's consequential. Most of the most prominent video games of the 20th century, of the late, of the 1990s were created on a Next computer. The Next computer is used at the Olympics. The Next computer, you were, if you're using an Apple product or you're using the App Store, or using most technology, you're using something that was created at Next but nobody had really gone back and done the deep dive of what happened at Next. So that's my next big project. Steve Jobs is exactly the sort of person where there's so much written and, and he's such a polarizing character, right? There's people who love him, people who hate him, and, and of course, a lot of people who are a bit of both. And um, so, I, I mean, I look forward to that. Any any timeline or it's a... It's oh, it's a, it's a long project. So hopefully, hopefully late next year, maybe the year after. I do wanna, my books take a long time because I, as you've probably noticed, I interview hundreds of people. So I'm at the very early innings of that project. Thank you so much for coming on. It was, it was, I mean, really remarkable talking to you and listening to all these stories. And, and, and I do genuinely recommend your book um, to anyone who's interested in Silicon Valley or sort of the world of startups and, and, and even the people involved, right? So, I mean, anyone who's today, I think, thinking of investing in Tesla, for example, should should get a better sense of who these people really are, right? And, and like you said, when they didn't have the public persona they have today and, and sort of see them at their rawest form. So, um, yeah. I mean, thank you so much for sharing those stories. And, and, and I, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Oh, no, I did. This was great fun. I mean, it's funny because you, you asked me a bunch of questions and I think if you were to interview me a week from now, I might have completely different answers to them because the questions were so good, right? Um, so I really appreciate it. Like you made me think even in the course of doing this interview and it, it's a credit to you and it, I, like hopefully, it, it, you know, you're doing right by your listeners because these questions were so thoughtful. So thank you for taking the time to do the interview and, you know, I look forward to, to keeping in touch and any listeners who want to connect with me, I'm on Twitter. I'm just at Jimmy A. Sony. They can find me and I'd love to riff with them too kind words and um you know when your next book is out i, I want to be the first guy to have you on <laughs> to talk about that Love it. I would, i'd be happy to do that <laughs>